Hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, coming in at the, I think this might be the last time slot, the last day before the uh, <laughs> design summit tomorrow. Who, who, out of curiosity, who all is staying for tomorrow, uh, t tomorrow's fr uh, Friday sessions for the? Right on. Uh, yeah. Who's local, in, who's local from Austin? Oh, I'm really proud of the rest of you for sticking it out this long at <laughs> the summit. Uh, thanks for coming. <laughs> Brief intro. Uh, I'm Luke Heidecke, Engineering Director at uh, Selenia. Uh, this is John Stanford, Vice President for uh, Product uh, Delivery uh, and, uh, sorry, Product and Engineering at Selenia. Um, he's been around since like, I don't know, uh, PDP 11s and TK 50s and stuff <laughs> like that. And, uh, <laughs> A while. I've, yeah. Both of us have been working on distributed systems, things like that, for quite some time. Uh, at Selenia, I'm part of the delivery side, if you were in an earlier session, um, and consulting side. John is on our uh, product side. So we got two of the three arms. Uh, we also do a lot of training for clients, uh, both in um, the space of, of OpenStack, but also Kubernetes, containers, and things like that, all really focused and driven by uh, open source infrastructure. Uh, we have offices uh, on the West Coast, San Francisco, New York City. Uh, and also in Tokyo, which is our newest office, and in Seoul, South Korea. Um, we work a lot with clients, um, both on the product side and on the consulting side, for uh, global 500 finance uh, uh, media companies and, and, and of that, uh, other customers of that nature. I'm going to go to hand it over to John to talk about some of the background and then uh, uh, what comes next. Thanks. Um, so, so our product, Goldstone, uh, started out as a, uh, I'd say, a, a fairly monolithic um, Django-based application. And as it grew and we started to incorporate more features, uh, we ended up with a, a pretty large sprawl of uh, back-end technologies and front-end technologies and, and ingestion technologies and all that good stuff. So fundamentally, as just a quick overview of what the product does, we bring in logs and events and metrics and structure data from OpenStack and start to you know, present that, uh, binding with some of the knowledge that the consulting side of the house brings to us. And um, you know, you, you'd recognize a bunch of the stack components, um, uh, and I'll show you some of those things as we go through. Um, one of the, of course, big challenges uh, is that getting a developer to deal with this stuff in a monolithic sense on their laptop is challenging. So developer spin up uh, was really tough for me. Uh, so there's lots of components. We have three language frameworks today. We use Python Django, we use JavaScript and Backbone, and we use Golang for some of the, some of the back end and smaller components that gather data. Um, we also have two variants of the product, an enterprise and, a, and an open source uh, variant. And, and so there's public and private repos and, and all kinds of uh, stuff like that and different packaging strategies for each one. Um, and we have a small but growing team of people. So when we bring in new developers, uh, I, you know, as the person who, uh, you know, wears about ten hats that I rotate around every day, uh, it, you have to deal with developer spin up and and want to make that as efficient as possible. So so we can get people working on the fun stuff, the the product. Um, so uh, developers, you know. A lot of them we uh, choose to develop on Mac. It's very convenient and nice, and that's where we started from. But as I started adding some people and consultants and things like this, well, we start getting Linux variants come into the, into the mix. I've got a guy doing stuff on MintOS, and and you know all of a sudden I've got some some sprawl. Not to mention the targets for production, uh, and, and we just have to try to rationalize that, and it started to get painful um, for developers. We tend to stand up an OpenStack node in a virtual machine next door to the you know next door to the to the code base that's running obviously in production that's going to be a, a much larger cloud and in our lab there are larger clouds to play with so we had to come to terms with that sort of thing as well so the initial state you know was was fundamentally the bowl of spaghetti um, not necessarily the code although there was a fair amount of that in the early days but but even from an infra infrastructure perspective the number of components talking to each other and and the you know the ports and configuration and logs and all that stuff so so the stack you know as it stands today consists of those things in production and, and potentially multiple instances of those things um, and, and the developer needs a reasonable subset of that to be able to to get the data from infrastructure to you know, do the work they need to do to interpret that kind of thing. 
So, you know, some of the big challenges are the project was growing in, in scope and, and, you know, code base and all that good stuff. The team was growing. Um, the, the knowledge that people, you know, people were coming in with about, uh, about virtualization and operating systems and all that good stuff uh, it varies, you know, quite a bit. I mean, you know, fundamentally, I'm looking for good developers. It's helpful if they have uh, infrastructure knowledge, but not always a requirement. If they're, you know, if they're really good front-end developers, I don't expect them to know a lot about, you know, setting up networking and, and virtualized storage and all kinds of fun stuff like that. Uh, so we need to, you know, figure out ways to to make this possible for them. Um, rapidly iterating is is one thing that I'm really, you know, big on. So uh, I come from a background where development, you know, it, my last big project that I worked on, we had an 11-second compile time, and you could really you could really go uh, put a line of code in and, and quickly see uh, the impact of that on the, on the real code base uh, in, a, in a very quick time. And so when I come to this world and, and we're you know, trying to get uh, things up and running, you know, some of these changes take a long time. And, and, and we'll talk a little bit as we go through about you know, sort of finding that balance. Um, uh, beyond that, you know, we want to kind of ship a product every couple of weeks and, or ship a version and, and, you know, make that releasable to the world. So um, those are some of the forces that were really challenging us uh, at the beginning. And, um, you know, our goal here is to talk to you about how we've tried to overcome some of those things. We haven't baked at all. I'll just give, you know, there's the sneak preview. It's not all fixed. But the reality is that, you know, we've, we've come a long way and, and uh, dealt with that. We also had challenges around different distributions, and we'll face this more as we sort of widen the scope of our product to hit, you know, hit different distributions that we work with and different releases of OpenStack come out. Um, and then, again, our open source versus commercial uh, variants of the product. So repeatability is a big thing. Um, we have dependencies on environmental stuff. We have dependencies on, on management, uh, or sorry, dependency management, the versions of the libraries that we use in our code. If those things change, you know, all of a sudden every developer has got to pull that and, and update in the monolithic world their virtual ENV that they were running in. And, and it just, you know, if they forget to do that, all of a sudden the code doesn't work for some reason or another, and then they need to, you know, and we need to communicate about why things are not working and do some triage and all that stuff. And, and it, as the team grows, I expect that would become a very difficult challenge to keep everybody synchronized in, in that type of world. Um, and then finally, you know, the integrity of testing uh, is important. Um, we need to be able to verify that developers have a very similar testing environment, it's certainly for unit and, and more and more towards integration testing that, as we do in our CI pipeline and, and our continuous test and delivery kind of stuff. So uh, that was fun. Um, we have some scalability issues to deal with, uh, single nodes for ease of development. So developers are working on a single node thing, multiple nodes or multiple versions of components for production. Um, how can we you know, quickly go from one to the other and, and verify that things are working nicely there? Uh, and so containers you know, kind of came up as a, as a way to um, potentially solve some of these pre repeatability and composability problems. And we also have some you know, longer term product aspirations. Selenia, you know, I, I think we've been around the OpenStack community for quite some time. I've been here since Hong Kong. Hong Kong was my uh, first day at Selenia. I arrived in Hong Kong. I started working at the OpenStack Summit day one a couple years ago. And um, uh, prior to that, you know, our folks have been around the community. But but fundamentally, we identify ourselves as an open infrastructure company. Uh, Luke was here uh, an hour or so ago giving a speech, uh, a presentation on Kubernetes, and we do a lot of stuff with Docker and, and, um, and uh, DevOps and things like that. Uh, so from a product perspective, I look at, at those guys to lead me, and, and if they're headed that direction, I want to make sure that my teams have some understanding of this technology so that when you know, when, when the leadership says, hey, we should have a Docker, you know, a Docker ma management platform, I can go ahead and, and do that without having to go retool everybody. Um, also, the trend in the industry has changed a bit uh, it, towards, you know, leaning towards containers as being a, a more safe, uh, safe route. They're starting to see it in consulting quite a bit. Um, you know, so, so we want to be up on that to, to just stay current and, and keep our people um, engaged in, in the cutting edge technologies that are coming. So I'm going to hand it back to Luke for the next, uh, next section. So, so the next piece is how do we kind of 
transition some of these uh, monolithic deployments uh, and, and into a containerized solution that's uh, composable but also reusable by uh, the developers in their day-to-day -day activities so that you don't fall into that sort of trap of deploying in one way for sort of production versus uh, test and development. We can continue the artifacts through the entire process. Um, so the first things we looked at was standardizing the base image. Um, sort of the first iterations of, of using uh, uh, containers, uh, we were using the official images um, and found it sort of difficult because some of the maintainers decided uh, it best to use an Ubuntu-based image or a Debian-based image um, or then some CentOS images. And there was uh, very little standardization. And we found it use very useful to uh, start out with a standardized base image that we could reuse um, that sort of helped us both in uh, the standardization of libraries and, and methods, but also in the uh, build time iterations that we, we, we could share um, the layers of those images between multiple, um, multiple images within the rest of the components of uh, the Goldstone server architecture. Uh, the next piece was, again, I kind of uh, hinted to it, was figure out ways of decomposing uh, the image requirements so that we could layer the dependencies and we were re reusing as much of our uh, Docker images as possible. So it starts out with that base image of, um, in this case, uh, Debian. Um, and as you know, we're looking at ways of uh, sort of we'll talking uh, later about sort of the f future improvements. Um, but, uh, but Debian sort of allowed us to still use package managers and have a, a fairly uh, minimized image in comparison to something like even Ubuntu. Um, and then uh, we included one of the other lessons learned was uh, sort of moving to a uh, where we were uh, including the, gold, the, the Goldstone code as the last layer within that so that developers could iterate quickly um, and not have to wait on all the prerequisites and things like that being installed. Um, so we'll show you right now sort of how we kind of went about some of that with uh, the initial base image. Here we, we start out, we're looking at uh, the image um, installing the prerequisites um, on top of a a, a base uh, unicorn image that we have created, we have versioned. Um, one of the issues we saw um, was that the way that Docker images, even the, the, fish, the official images, um, that the way that they tagged and versioned those images changed uh, significantly between projects. Um, and it caused us some headaches we'll go into later, um, that we, we really, it's very important us to, for us to keep a consistent base image and a consistent experience and set of dependencies and things like that for developers. Um, so that was the first step. Then we go down to the, the environment statements. We wanted to have an easy way to override statements if need be as customers go into production, but keep things consistent between environments. So we expose certain environment variables, um, have a con you know, consistent work directory, uh, and then go into, um, this is broken across several slides because it's uh, nice and robustly long. <laughs> um, we go into breaking out um, the build requirements and the prerequisites. The build requirements are only needed for the initial pip install or um, other, other packages, and the prereqs are something that should be included as the, uh, as the image goes and, and runs whatever application is on top of it. Again, in this case, uh, Geonicorn. Um, you're starting to see here if it would be, from, from my sort of standpoint, it would be really nice if this was declarative, a little more declarative, so that I could sort of say, I need these things installed, figure out whatever the base image is, get it installed, rather than some of this um, machination <laughs> between uh, every image. I, you know, we end up using a lot of these same um, sort of uh, characteristics throughout all the base, uh, throughout all the Docker images. Um, and it gets a bit redundant, especially if you change your methodology. Um, so that's sort of one other lesson learned we found as we're adopting these uh, uh, containers is that, uh, you know, keeping things consistent, but, um, and making sure you're looking across your entire catalog. I think we have, um, a dozen. A, a, yeah, a dozen or so images, and um, that, that continues to grow as, you know, I just decided to create other images and I want to keep things consistent. Um, it it's sure would be nice if that could be a little bit declarative. Um, so we go into making some of the basic directories. And in part three, um, 
one of the things we found, uh, and we'll go into sort of, again, the lessons learned here, is that um, initially we had a lot of these layers uh, as optimized as possible, so that um, the build recs and the pre -recs were installed, we installed our software and the, and the pip uh, install for requirements with for uh, Django and then the Goldstone server, um, but uh, we then wanted to remove the build recs and clean up the image some, uh, and we, could, we were able to save a lot of space. The downside is that that caused a l much longer build time. So if the, it, it's that weighing of, of uh, build time versus the iteration frequency, and if, if a developer is trying to build an image and see an instant feedback, um, maybe change some re requirements, change versions um, on their local machine, waiting 20 minutes can be frustrating and, you know, um, you know, go get some more coffee isn't always the answer. Um, <laughs> sooner or later you get uh, all coffeeed out and it's nice to, so in, in this case we actually separated out these layers so that um, developers can easily ch change some of the Python environment uh, requirements without having to uh, completely reinstall all the prereqs every time they rebuild the image. Uh, so we take this image, we have a Docker ent entry point script that merely just uh, is able to read in some of the environment files and, and start it in a repeatable way. Um, we, we then uh, layer that on top with the app image, and that last, uh, we, we have several images that use this base image, um, this base unicorn, um, or unicorn, <laughs> whatever it is, uh, um, uh, image, and this one is the application image. We also have like Celery, for example, would reuse that same, uh, those, those base dependencies uh, as, a, as a base image. This one takes the Goldstone server code and overlays it into the Aptor. Uh, and then everything else, the entry point, everything else works uh, without need to change it. Um, we then take that and we're using Docker Compose for development. Um, so certainly we're, we're also um, able to port this into other orchestration frameworks, including Kubernetes. Um, but wanted to walk through real quick that it allows us to easily do that linkage, easily be understandable developers fairly quickly. I think the onboarding for this was um, fairly straightforward. Um, and it, it allowed us to also do some of the logging and, and ingest that back into um, the development framework so we could see actually what was going on um, within the Docker images. Um, as an example, in the developer uh, environment, uh, we change things slightly. We have a different environment file. Uh, we add some volumes so that developers can, as the Docker image is running, they can make changes within uh, the, the code for Django and instantly see feedback without having to rebuild the entire image as long as those base dependencies don't change. Um, they could also easily boot in the image, do uh, virtually MV, and, and test some of those things out a lot easier than having to rebuild the image every time. Once they're able to test that, then they can put that back in and through our CI uh, um, uh, system, then rebuild those images and ha have it go through the full set of unit tests and integration tests and things like that. So I'll hand it back to John to talk about uh, the next piece. Great, thank you, Luke. I, I wanna make a couple points before I move on to the next slide. Uh, this really you know, highlights a couple of the, I think the key advantages to Docker. What, what Luke said about you know, developers kind of instantly getting this stuff, I think stems from the fact that you've got very few places to look to see a fairly wide view of what's going on here. You, you know, start with the compose file and you go, oh, I see, it's got an app server, it's got an Elasticsearch server, it's got a Logstash server, it's got a, you know, various other types of, of containers. Um, and then if I look at the, the difference of this and the production, I see that I'm overlaying, you know, the code for, for the developers so that they can iterate quickly. And that was, you know, finding that balance has been, has been, an interesting experience. Uh, I think we're still searching uh, for, for the right balance. I'd love to get, you know, iteration time, you know, uh, cycle time faster, but, but at the same time, I don't want to compromise the, the end to end, you know, repeatability of these environments. And so we'll continue to work on that. Um, but I think it's fair to say that our current state is less like a bowl of spaghetti and more like a table full of banchan or something else that comes in small containers. Uh, we've got isolated functionality that we can triage and, and do some you know, uh, assessment of and work with in, in that fashion when we need to versus trying to sort out what's going on across all these different 
processes on the same virtual machine or on the same hardware uh, where you have you know, configs scattered all over in different directories and you've got log files going everywhere and not consolidated and certainly not time sequenced uh, in one place. So, so we get you know, some of that kind of stuff. So I wanted to talk a little bit about you know, what our topology looks like now. We, we went from that sort of you know, monolithic view of the world to something that people can grok pretty well. Um, the, you know, the configs and the uh, environment files and all that stuff is organized into a, into a tree structure um, within the repo for the top layer of images, the, the actual ones that support the Goldstone product. Um, developers typically don't need to dig much deeper than that to see what's going on. Rarely do, do they get down into the, the base images to, to do something unless we have an explicit goal of versioning those images or you know, bumping a version in those things and everybody's got to cascade up and, and we'll address that as it, as it happens. But, but fundamentally, this is the layer they, they work with. So uh, a developer sees two different experiences, whether they're an open source developer or an enterprise developer. An enterprise, um, it's the same base image for say Django and Celery, but uh, but we bring in a different set of code. So we, we, you know, we're bringing in the open source code plus, you know, plus the enterprise code into those images. Um, they don't need to think about that. All they need to do is, is use the compose file for enterprise developers or the compose file for, uh, for uh, open source developers. And, and the, enterprise, uh, the enterprise images come from an enterprise repo that's authenticated and the open source uh, images come from the Docker Hub, which is, is open. So that's worked out pretty well. Um, there's another variant of developer. Uh, I don't think that I have that slide in here. Um, the, the other variant of developer is the, is the split between front end and back end developers. And that's purely uh, a removal of some back end, you know, debugging type of containers. Like if I've got people working on search, you know, I might want to have them uh, have a Kibana instance to back up their search exploration stuff. And, and it's not something we ship with our product, but it's something that they can use during development to quickly get to a, get to a query that, against Elasticsearch that gets them the data they need to fill out the, you know, fill out the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the feature of the product that they're trying to address. Same thing with Flower. Flower is a celery monitoring task. So a front end guy doesn't really need this or gal doesn't really need these things um, in their day to day. And, and so we, we just have another compose file that doesn't have those uh, in place. Uh, similarly, in production, um, you know, we, we take out those debugging, you know, kind of containers. We have the open source and enterprise variants that are fundamentally the same, except for that last layer uh, of copying code in. But we also remove some of the, some of the developer image building kind of tools like the, um, like the entry point scripts and the Docker files and all that stuff doesn't ship and doesn't need to be in production. So uh, we, we, we kind of ended up right now with sort of four developer compose files and, and two production compose files. And then there's a CI one that's uh, similar to developer, uh, but uses images instead of building containers in place. So uh, we, we, we're trying to, I'd love to get that down. And I think Luke, more importantly, would love to get that down to a, a much smaller number uh, for sustainability and all that stuff and just, just repeatability across the life cycle. But so far, you know, so far it seems to be a fairly good balance. So. You know, what, um, what have we done to sort of get the development teams up to speed? You know, how, how, did, we, how did we go from monolithic to, you know, to uh, container-based world? Um, the first big thing is that it, it became a lot easier to script the setup of a developer environment. It's literally, you know, clone the repo, uh, Docker pull the, the images from the compose file, or, you know, use the Docker compose, you know, pull it pulling up kind of commands to get images on board. A little bit of setup still. Um, for backend developers, they typically want to have a virtual ENV because they may want to run tests outside the container. They may not want to get in the container for all this activity. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in the lessons learned section and some of the you know, uh, overcorrection kind of mistakes we made uh, as we went through this process. But um, fundamentally, it's, it's, it's a lot easier than trying to run the whole application on your desktop, you know, on your on your Mac laptop, um, with all the various you know brew tools and virtual env tools and library differences and all that stuff. So um, that smoothed out quite a bit. Uh, getting the developer environments uh, started, you know, 
We've got scripts for that, that that just basically set up and start all these processes. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how far to go with that stuff in, in our opinion. Uh, I'd say there was a bit of overcorrection there as well. I'm sort of giving you a sneak preview. But then the other piece is the, uh, the, the version management of these images and how it associates with the versions of the code base itself. So we've got scripts to do bumping and building and pushing images around and up to repos and things like that. And, and that's an area that's probably still a, a work in progress. Um, so, you know, what is the learning curve for a developer? You come onto my team, you know, oh boy, you've got this application, it's all Dockerified, you know, what, what do I need to do and how do I get it? Um, fortunately, we're in a position where our training staff offers a Docker 101 kind of class and, and we can lean on them to get that, that information. Uh, but, you know, but fundamentally, it's not, uh, it, there's not that much you need to know about Docker to be a developer on, on our team. You know, you need to start containers and stop containers and list what's running and, and maybe delete, delete containers and images on occasions and, and the basics. Um, if, you're, you know, if you're managing the, the container strategy uh, development, then you, you probably need to know stuff about Compose and, and a little more deeper detail on Docker networking and things like that. Uh, but you know, uh, for, the, uh, for the front end developer or the front of the back end developer, it's, it's, you know, it's pretty straightforward. Um, one of the things that became really uh, I'd say a lot easier was using uh, Docker's, you know, consolidated logging from all the containers, spitting them out as JSON, and, and developers can see all that stuff. And so they can see the sweet sequence of events that maybe led to a problem. They can see it across the database and Elasticsearch and the application server, Celery, which might be having a, a re recurring task that's causing trouble. You can kind of see it all stream by, uh, captured if you need to. Um, we haven't taken it any further, like shoving that into an Elasticsearch instance. But um, you know, I, I think it's in a form that we could pretty easily do that if we wanted to and, and replicate that strategy for both the production and the developer viewpoints. Um, like I said, the back-end developers might need a little more networking, storage, uh, networking and storage experience, but typically uh, the back-end developers uh, that, that, that we find that are a good fit for the team have a little bit of that anyway. They kind of come from this community or Docker community or other, other sort of virtualization-heavy kind of communities. Um, we're still learning this last one. The, the, the association of versions of Docker images to the associations of commits in, you know, in a Git repo is a, is a challenging thing. And, and if you're working on anything that's even a moderately complex code base, uh, and by moderately complex, I usually mean more than one or two developers, possibly using sub-modules, multiple repos, you know, all that kind of stuff. It, it becomes a really interesting challenge to keep everything in sync, and you kind of end up with some chicken egg, you know, kind of things, and, and um, you know, generally the, the pushing of images up to places where you can share them with your distributed team uh, is, a, is a slow process and you kind of want to minimize that to the times when you've actually changed images. So that, that's something that we're still working on, but I think we're getting you know, closer to something that, that makes us all you know, relatively happy. Um, so, so on that theme, you know, I'll, I'll just do one small rant. Um, Semver is really neat uh, if you, if you use it, not just say you use it. So uh, the major version, you know, for big API changes, minor version for uh, a little functionality and, and backward compatibility stuff, and, and patches for, for really bug fixes and things like that, is a great uh, mental model for versioning software. Uh, it would be a great mental model for versioning images, but, but um, it, it gets conflated uh, with Docker when you have, um, really two things that you're trying to version. The, the thing that you're putting in the container and the, con or so the thing that you're putting in the image and the image itself. So uh, there's, you know, we, we, this is one of the reasons why we end up uh, building our own base images because we can intercept this upstream image and make sure that they haven't had a, uh, released an image with the same version but different, you know, different Docker behavior. So uh, that, that's my small rant, and I think that's the last one I have in here, so we'll just move on. And I'm going to hand it back over to Luke uh, to talk about some of our, you know, more questionable uh, moves as we've gone through this process. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so one of the first pieces we saw is just the, in sort of the exuberance to 
to adopt containers and, and get things as optimized as possible, um, as, as, as clean as possible, um, we've found the need to kind of take a step back and look at the optimization between the build time and, as I mentioned, the, the developer iteration time and, and periods of those iterations so that, um, so that you, you're not punishing the developers for the optimization of the build time or the runtime just uh, and, and vice versa. Um, and and the, the other thing piece there is making sure that you're not, uh, you're still providing ways that developers uh, for both uh, development issues but also in production issues that you still give a method towards debugging the application within the container. The next piece we, we tried and found some issues, a, a, lot, a lot of times just the developer's day-to-day, -day, was in the use of data volume containers. It was an early sort of recommendation with, with Docker and as, as a, a good way to sort of keep your data separate from, um, from your application containers. Um, you, you ended up with uh, sort of a, a double uh, penalty of uh, volumes sticking around, especially when you were in CI, you know, CI environments or in developer environments, consistently trying to iterate on that, and then you, you find yourself with a bunch of data volume containers, and that there's a lot of better methods for abstracting that storage and keeping around uh, the, the volumes just by, for example, declaring a volume in your, uh, within Compose at, at uh, start time, rather than having that as a, an entirely separate uh, volume that runs. And they've improved that some, and we, that we had some interesting, uh, fun times with uh, those. Um, some of the time also, the, the notion that we were probably trying to abstract too much from the developers and too many scripts and um, you know, things to make their lives easier, and instead of uh, allowing them to kind of better learn Docker and, and Compose and how things were, were uh, uh, were combined together into the application as a whole. Um, really, a basic proficiency in the uh, both the commands and internals of Docker and also the orchestration platform is we just found very important and very helpful for developers, both in just day-to-day -day usage of it, not feeling frustrated when something goes wrong, but also in just better architecture for the applications themselves too. Um, the last kind of thing we kind of look back is that trusting of the upstream uh, with the, their way of doing tagging, their way of doing versioning. Um, one of the things is updates may not be in the same cadence, so that, uh, for example, on the base OS image, um, you know, it's very easy to miss a very critical update if, if your cadence uh, is different from the release cycle of, of those, uh, those base OS images, even. Um, one of the other pieces is the mainstream or official images um, don't use the same versioning and tagging standards, um, so that you know while one might have some way of, of sort of tracking the difference between uh, Postgres uh, 9.4 release uh, you know container release one versus container release two, uh, th they don't, and um, it has broken code upstream or, or downstream for us in the past. So this allows us to. Um, Speaking of that, I have a nice little Docker version reminder camp just pop up my screen. Uh, <laughs> um, the uh, yeah, very helpful of them. Um, <laughs> the so having some of those same standards, being able to control some of that stuff and, and how things are released and have that sta standard base image has been very beneficial for us. Um, that does remind me that the, the one of the nice things with onboarding. Um, has been the differences in the, in the new way of doing some of the, the Docker for Mac, for example. Um, that it, the Docker machine was a, a large, painful set um, between, you know, do you like Fusion? Do you like uh, virtual, uh, um, uh, uh, virtual box? Virtual box, or hate it uh, with a passion, um, or can you run it natively with Linux and things like that? Even those differences was, ca was causing, like, for example, with volumes, causing a, a bit of an issue for a while there for us. Um, this is certainly a good move in the future if they uh, don't introduce more bugs um, instead of helping us fix them. Um, <laughs> so some of the course corrections was, with, with some, of, uh, some of the issues I just mentioned were using our own base images. Um, 
we probably still don't have it right, but we, we've moved to using a commit hash for our image version so that we can be very specific in the versioning. Um, I'd, I'd prefer something more like uh, a channel tagging where you have a, um, an alpha, beta, and stable release um, and that you, you just trust in your CI and your tests, both your unit tests and your integration tests to yeah. fall back on if, if those versions don't work out. Um, but that's something we, you know, just between the developers and, and uh, you know, staff helping them with some of the CI stuff. Uh, hopefully, we can figure that out at some point. And if, certainly, if you guys have a, a more creative way or or, or more uh, sound way of, of doing it, we're we're always kind of check, checking out what might be the best strategy for that. Um, the the other piece is the composition variance of of wanting to that trade off between wanting to have a single way of, of composing the application as it went through the entire. Uh, life cycle from development and test and uh, unit test and integration test um, into sort of a production uh, version. Um, CI right now that that only really it mirrors production um, and only has some slight changes just given the nature of the platform that we're using. Um, I, I still think that could be improved some so that um, it's being deployed the same way um, every single time no matter what. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll uh, continue to have corrections on them, I'm sure. Every build, we're getting better, which is yep. great. You know, trying to keep keep um, keep track of the build times and all that stuff, and trying to reduce them as we go. Factoring in anything new code that we've created, new new images that are in the in the composition. But um, but I think all these things are are headed in the right direction. The the version stuff is is probably the biggest challenge I think that that we're facing, and it's 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 really a balance between I don't want to be pushing every you know. Every time I do a commit, or, or even every time I do a pull request, I really don't want to be pushing image versions up necessarily, certainly if they haven't changed. Um, <clears throat> even if, if very few, since we're, since we're adding some code in there that has active steps in the, in the, uh, in the Docker file, even, even if those layers um, haven't changed uh, significantly, the, the code base has, and that's being copied in, and it causes, you know, causes a new layer to be generated in the image virtually every time, and, and that has an impact on the time of the push. So, um, so we're, we're somewhere in this balance of you know, tagging with the, you know, with the commit hash and a branch name and, and you know, manually pushing images when a developer has uh, remembered that they made a change that affects the, the Docker layer of the application. Um, and, and that's, you know, that remembering piece is the piece that I'd like to, you know, automate somehow and do some detection based on Git comparison against the, against the branch you're PRing into or, or whatever. So uh, we'll, you know, like I said, continue to work on that. Uh, Luke's been very instrumental in making this a successful effort. So some of the things that I just noticed and I figured I'd share also uh, it are some of the helpful commands that as developers were coming on board that um, they had to run quite often and that sort of eased their, their pain there. Um, that's a typo there, but you get the idea. <laughs> um, the, being able to easily remove uh, images and start with a clean environment, uh, a clean and consistent environment, uh, what was one. Uh, then being able to selectively target, uh, it was very helpful also in uh, being able to uh, remove all Goldstone related images, for example. Um, the, the next one we found out was, was being able to, you know, again, for developers being able to easily get into the container um, and exec some commands, especially debugging commands, um, check out internals, run things manually. Um, and the other thing was the difference because we use a lot of entry point scripts, being able to uh, push to the developers that they need the, the differences, and that was one of the sort of that fundamentals learning experience was making sure that they know um, that there is such thing as entry points, what they do, why why we're adding this uh, seemingly unnecessary complication, um, and then giving them a method to also do the same thing for images that so have. Entry that points. one's really that one's really interesting. Actually, this command is the one that um, is probably helps you with your most frustrating situation: is your container didn't start, and you don't know why. Um, this is the one that will get you into the container around the entry point and to a shell where you can start poking around and, and possibly editing files, you know, config files to quickly cycle and, and figure out what went wrong in your container and get it up and running so that you can start to inspect the code base. Especially if the issue is with the startup itself or with the right. entry point yeah, itself. Right, yeah, that's, yes, <laughs> exactly. So, we can 
Okay, so you know, so where are we headed? Um, some of the things that that I think uh, you know are on our radar for future. Obviously, it's it you know I think the message is pretty clear. It's all about finding that balance between developer cycle time and and consistency of your environment through its life cycle. So um, today we have a, a the base layer of of Docker images out in their own repos, and we're starting to add add testing to those things as an independent unit to make sure they're functioning the way we expect them. Um, the Goldstone, you know, the, the product layer uh, images are, are still in our Git repo, so they haven't been isolated. I'm not 100% I'm not sure that that's the right thing, but I am pretty sure that we should have, uh, you know, isolated testing for each one of those things and, and to be able to test the, the perimeter of the images and make sure that they're doing what we expect. Um, as we take in more features from our product management layer, uh, you know, the, the, the notion of, I'll say microservices very loosely, uh, at least composition or decomposition of, of the application and, and putting those features off in their own containers um, seems to be catching some, you know, catching some interest and seems to be making development easier in the sense that you can focus on on the feature with the boundaries of the feature and, and develop it off there and, and you just need to sort out how to get data back to the to the main you know data layers uh, which is also why I don't really call it microservices we're not doing much service discovery it's it's you know the compose file satisfies a bunch of that stuff for us um, <clears throat> but uh, I'll give you an example. We've just added a, a canary feature. So we've got a, a little uh, container that runs. It's 16 megabytes. I love that part. It, it runs uh, every five minutes a job to start a virtual machine in a cloud, uh, attach a volume, you know, check a floating or add a floating IP, do some other stuff, and then tear it back down, and then report the timing data for that stuff back to um, back to the main Goldstone application, so we can, you know, help customers evaluate over time whether their API performance and the underlying services subsequently are degrading or, or staying consistent or, you know, hopefully improving because they've, you know, better capacity and better performance. But um, those are the kinds of, you know, microservice-y kind of things that we'll start looking at every feature and going, can this stand alone by itself? You know, or is it somehow too tied to the data? And if it is, then why is that? And have we thought about something architecturally wrong to, you know, that makes it not decomposable into something that we can use? Um, finding smaller footprints for images. I think our biggest image right now is like 600 megabytes. It's not huge. It's it's huge by by some standards, but um, it's reasonable. Although seeing you know things like Alpine. Um, and, and, you know, this, this uh, canary container running at 16 megabytes, I go, okay, well, you know, any component that doesn't have a reason to be running on Debian or, or any other base, you know, we should look at this and see if we can make installation and spin up and push and build the whole life cycle faster. That would be awesome. Uh, and then, of course, the, the versioning strategy, which I think I've, uh, I've hit on enough today, so I'll, I'll leave that one alone, but we'll keep working on it, though. Um, so I want to give Ch Luke a chance to... Uh, plug uh, an event that's coming up uh, uh, that, that he's really near and dear to. So we'll wrap it up, but uh, just want to give, all, I'll he give you all a heads up. Uh, my separate life, uh, focusing a lot on, on the Kubernetes SIG, we have a Southern California meetup in LA, actually El Segundo. Um, if you can make it, it'd be great, hosted by uh, AT&T. Um, there's going to be talks by some guys from Google, actually, about continuous delivery pipeline using Jenkins on Kubernetes. Um, Selenia, we're going to have uh, very large scale deployments of Kubernetes clusters on OpenStack. And then also there's a good talk from Amgen um, about implementing PaaS on top of the enterprise. Um, and uh, anytime, hit us up on Twitter. Um, I'm on the Kubernetes Slack a lot. Um, uh, JX Stanford on Twitter. Uh, yep. just yeah, ping me. Um, I will note that I, we're hiring both consulting side and, and development side and probably training side. Uh, so if anybody's uh, really interested in what we're doing, you know, maybe have seen our booth and, and get, a, get a pitch from what we're about what we're up to, uh, please reach out to us. You can, you know, uh, reach me on Slack or you can email me at John at Selenia or hit our careers page and look at what's going on. Uh, if something out there doesn't match what you do and you think you're, you know, you're a good fit for our company, please just, you know, Give me a shout. Uh, I'll put you in touch with uh, whoever the right person is if it's not me. Uh, and on that, I'll say I know we went a little over time, but uh, questions, uh, we'll, we'll take a couple if, uh, if the guys in the back of the room will allow us to. Or afterwards, too. So. Yeah. 
Thanks a lot, guys. Okay, thank you.